أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين First of all, أسعد الله أيامكم for the birth anniversary of the heroes of Karbala. Uh, it's narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi that he said, أحب الله من أحب حسينا May Allah love the one who loves Al-Husayn alayhi salam. Our discussion for tonight is going to be in three points. Based on this hadith or in explaining this hadith, in the first point, we speak about the meaning of love and the different levels of it. The second point, the connection between love and morality. What is the connection between love and morality? And then we end, we conclude in the third point, uh, to ask why do we love the heroes of Karbala? Or why do we love the Imams alayhim salam in general? These are the three points that we're going to discuss. So we start with having the correct intention of attending for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa bi barakat salati ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Love is defined as inclinations towards one person or an object. It's an intense feeling that fills your heart with emotions and make you attracted to a certain thing. However, what is meant by love can differ from one case to another. Some people have this discussion or this debate whether love is a selfless or a selfish act. Is it a selfless or a selfish act? It is commonly known that love is a selfless act where the feelings you have, they make you concentrate on someone else rather than concentrating on yourself. When you love someone, you think about them more than you think about yourself. You start concentrating on them more than you concentrate on yourself. On the other side, a group of people, they argue that love is a selfish act and not a selfless act. They say it is true that you're concentrating on someone else. But what is the reason for this concentration? You're concentrating on someone else because you feel a need inside of you to be loved. And you feel a need inside of you to love someone. So when you love someone, it's due to this feeling that you have inside of you. So, according to them, they believe that this love is a selfish act. You're just feeding the need that you find inside of you. I'll give you an example for one of the Indian philosophers who is known by the name of Osho. Have you heard of Osho? Good. <laughs> Better not to hear about him. Osho, he has a book called Being in Love. He argues in this book, he says, that it is a good thing to be selfish. He says, selfish is a good attribute. How? He says, although selfishness is surrounded by negativity from people, but it has a positive aspect to it. He says, you can't love someone before you love yourself. If you don't love yourself first, you're not going to be able to love someone else. If you don't know yourself first, you're not going to be able to know someone else. And he gives this example. He says, if, you, if you're not selfish and you don't work on loving yourself, you'll be similar to a beggar who asks for help from another beggar. You'll be similar to someone who doesn't have money and he asks for help from someone who doesn't have money. You'll be someone who doesn't have love and you're asking to, be, to love or to be loved from someone else who doesn't have love to. If we want to respond on, on this argument, we can say that uh, this philosopher, o, uh, Osho, he mixed between selfishness and self-care. There's two terms, there's selfishness and there's self-care. Selfishness is defined as lacking consideration 
for other people, which is, we can't question that it's a negative uh, thing, to lack consideration for other people. While self-care is defined as the practice of taking action to preserve or improve one's own health, which can be done by taking care of others. You can take care of yourself, and at the same time, you can take care of others. So there's no contradictions between self-care and not being selfish. And I think he mixed between self-care and selfishness. As for love being selfish or, or selfless, this depends on the level or the type of love that you practice. What is the type of love that you follow? Love has more than one level. The first level of love is the divine love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu man yartadda minkum an deena, fasawfa yati Allahu bi qawmin yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbunahum. O you who believe, whoever of you should revert or leave his religion, Allah will bring forth in place of them people, who, people he will love and who will love him. Allah will bring people that he will love and they will love him. This is the type of love that we refer to as the divine love. It's a love that comes from our nature. It's an eternal love. And also we can say it's a real love that connects us with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah created mankind, He said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي And when I have balanced him, balanced uh, the human being, and breathe into him from my created soul. Breathing into us from the created soul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it means that Allah created us to be a reflection of his mercy and to be a sign for his existence. He is the complete perfection. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the complete perfection. And this is why we find the love of perfection inside our nature. Because he breathed into us from his created soul. And due to this, we feel the need of seeking perfection in this life. Seeking perfection represents the divine love between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This type of love, if, it, if it's practiced in a proper way, it can remove all selfishness. It can remove all selfishness. When you reflect on this existence and you understand or you comprehend that there's no power and there's no will except that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you will purely love him because you will find him worthy of being loved. And through this love, when you remove selfishness and you forget yourself and only concentrate on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will find the way for self-care. If you want to take care of yourself, this is the path. To forget yourself, to forget al-ana that we spoke about before, and concentrate on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As long as you believe that He is the source of power and He is the source of fuel. So every good thing that you will have, or every good thing that you have or will have in the future, it comes from Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the first type of love. The second type of love is human love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuha al-nasu inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. O mankind, indeed, we have created you from male and female and made you people and tribes that you may know one another. You may know one another means you may love one another. Why would you get to know someone or be close to someone if you don't love them? To be truly close, not for for worldly benefits. To be truly close to someone, this is done when you love them. Or in the in the verse that speaks about marriage, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa min ayatihi an khalaqa lakum min anfusikum azwajan li taskunu ilayha wa ja'ala baynakum mawaddatan wa rahma. And he made between you compassion and mercy. It's translated as love and the better word or term is compassion, compassion and mercy. You would not be with someone or live with someone if you don't love them. 
unless you're forced, then this is a this is a different different story. But in a normal situation, you wouldn't stay with someone if you don't if you don't uh, love them. And if you look at this verse, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً Compassion and mercy. You'll find that Allah didn't use the word mahabba. He used the, the term mawadda. You know why? Because ma- mahabba, it can be a feeling that you have inside of, inside of your heart. While al-mawadda is showing or expressing this love that you have. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't want you to just have this feeling inside your heart. He wants you to express this feeling to others. Now it's true that I love because I need to be loved. This is something true. We can't escape from. But when I express my love to others and I take care of them, then I can escape from being selfish. So although I'm doing it because I need it, I'm doing it because I find a need in, inside of me. But when I express my love to others through al mawadda when I take care of others, then I will escape from being selfish. This is the second type of love. The third type is the love of desires. So after the divine love, after the love of uh, or human love, you have the third type, which is the love of desires. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Beautified for people is the love of that which they desire. Desires, as we mentioned previously, or last two weeks ago we spoke about it, we said desires are part of you. These desires can be religiously accepted or rejected. If they are accepted, you practice them through halal means. If they are rejected, you try to suppress yourself through struggling your soul. But regardless of the acceptance or the rejection, the the rejection of these desires, you'll find that you love them. You love these desires that you have. Whether you practice them or not, you still love them. And you try your best to stay away from the haram desires that you have, as much as you, as much as you, you can. Now, the, the second type of human love, when it's practiced, as we said, there's a social aspect to it. You do it because you want something. You want to fulfill the social need that you have. The love of desires, when you practice it, You practice it because you need something. You need to fulfill fulfill your desires. So we can say that these types of love are not true love. They are done for a reason. They are done for you to achieve something. While the first type of love, the divine love, if it's practiced in a proper way, if it's practiced in a proper way, it can be the only true love that you live in your life. Because when you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a proper way, you only love him for the signs of perfection and beauty that you see in him, and not for anything, for anything else. This is what Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, reached when he said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I, I, did, I, haven't, I did not worship you for, uh, to receive uh, your pleasures or for the sake of being scared from your punishment, but I have worshipped you because I found you worthy of being worshipped. I worshipped Allah, I loved Allah, Amir Muhammad says, because I found him worthy of being loved, not for the sake of paradise and not for the sake of staying away from hellfire, but because he saw the signs of beauty and love in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are we good so far? Inshallah, yalla. If we go to the second point, we'll salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. This is the first point. Love and the different levels of love. Second point, the connection between love and morality. There is a natural connection between love and morality. Both are manifestations of the social nature of a human being. Morality is an action. But not every action is a moral act. If I move my hand, just this move is not a moral act. If I walk, 
moving my, my, my feet is not considered a moral act. While helping the poor, being just, being truthful are considered a moral act. So when do we consider an act as a moral and when do we consider it as, as non-moral act, if, if, if we can say To, to distinguish between them, we need to define what is morality. What is morality? What do we mean by morality when we say al-khuluq? What is al-khuluq? If we refer back to philosophy, we find more than one definition for morality. I'll mention three of them, and I'll try to respond to each one of them. Then the fourth one, I give the Islamic definition of morality. The first definition is the definition of Descartes. Have you heard of Descartes? Have you heard of Descartes? Descartes was a French philosopher. He believes that morality is when you, over, when you overcome selfishness. Morality is when you overcome selfishness. In this universe, you and I exist. True? Do we exist? Inshallah. Any action I take purely for the sake of others is considered a moral act. Any action I take for the sake of myself is not considered a moral act, even if it's a good act. So anything I perform for the sake of others is, is a moral act. But if I do it for myself, it's not a moral act. For example, if I find someone poor, someone in need of help, if I offer help, if I offer to help them and support them financially, there is no doubt that this is a moral act. But if I do that in front of others for them to see that I'm helping the poor, here they say this is not a moral act. Because you're not doing it purely for others. You're doing it to feed your ego, to show yourself in front of people that you're someone good or to gain more respect in the, in the community. So this is the definition of morality according to Descartes. To respond, on, to respond on this first definition, we say that the definition is not very accurate. Because when we study the actions of human beings, we find that some, some people, they perform and act purely for the sake of others, but at the same time, we don't consider it to be a moral act. So you will find people who perform and act purely for the sake of others, but we don't consider it a moral act. I'll give you an example. And please concentrate on this example so you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It's a simple example, but um, maybe it's a bit sensitive, especially for the sisters. When a mother spends all day and night taking care of her children, do we consider this a moral act or not? The sister said yes, moral act, quickly. Socially, yes, we say this is a moral act, socially. Philosophically, we say no, it's not a moral act. Why does the mother spend all her time taking care of her children? Because she wants to do something good? No. She does that due to the nature of being a mother, this gharisa that she has. She needs to fulfill this nature, or this feelings that she, have, that she has, and due to this, she takes care of her children. So we don't, philosophically, we don't look at it as a moral act. We look at it as a great responsibility that comes from the purified nature of being a mother. A mother can't sit and say, I want to do this good thing, I want to take care of my kids today, but tomorrow I don't want to do it. No, she's responsible for it. She's responsible to take care of her kids. You get it? Although she's doing it purely for the sake of her children. The Karate says any action performed, performed for the sake of others is a moral act. This example it shows that the definition is not that accurate because a mother, she performs an act purely for the sake of her children, and with that we don't consider it philosophically as a moral act. The second definition is the definition of Kant. Kant was a German philosopher. He believes that any action you take 
out of feeling responsible is considered a moral act. And any action you think about and your mind blames you for leaving it is considered a moral act. So any action you think about and your mind blames you for leaving it is considered a moral act. For example, if you find an orphan who is really in need, you feel responsible. You feel it is your responsibility to help them, to help them out. And if you don't help this orphan, your mind will blame you. Right? You'll feel bad for not helping them. So this is morality according to Kant. To respond on this definition, we say that what is mentioned is correct. However, sometimes you can leave uh, you, you can refrain from helping someone and your mind would not uh, blame you. Let me give you an example. If you have two poor people in front of you and you have money to help one of them, you decide to help person A and you don't help person B, would your mind blame you for that? This is what you're able to do. Or if you see someone in need and you don't have any money to help, would your mind blame you for that? No. So according to this, you can't say that morality is every action that your mind blames you if you, if you leave it. It's not an accurate, it's correct from an aspect, but it's not a complete definition uh, for morality. The third definition is the definition of Sartre, who was a French philosopher. He believes that morality is a social agreement. Morality, al-khuluq, is a social agreement. I don't harm you, so you don't harm me back. I don't lie to you, so you don't lie to me back. Morality are a set of principles that intellectual people agree upon in order to maintain a safe, a safe social environment. This is the definition of morality. Now, to respond on this definition, we say this is one of the most dangerous definitions for morality in philosophy. Most da dangerous definition. Why? It shows that morality is not practiced due to the love of good. It's practiced why? To be protected. Correct? It says to be protected. I don't harm you, so you don't harm me back. And if that's the case, then morality becomes important for the weak people. As for those who have power, it's not important for them to practice any act of morality. And maybe a lot of politicians today, they follow this definition of Sartre, where they don't feel that there's a need for them to practice any act of morality. The fourth definition, which is the Islamic definition of morality. Morality, or al-khuluq, can be defined as the love for perfection and beauty. The love for perfection and beauty. Mankind in their nature love beauty. They love beauty. Beauty can be physical through something that you see, or it can be reflected through an action that you perform or through a word that you say. People are attracted to beauty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa innahu lihubb al-khayri la shadeed. Usually they translate al-khayr to wealth. But we understand from this verse, and indeed he is in love of wealth intense. The meaning of al-khayr here is the love of good, the love of beauty, the love of perfection. وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدِ It means that he loves everything that is good. So wealth can be included as one of the examples of al-khayr. But we don't limit al-khayr to financial, the financial aspect only. Because beauty is a good thing, is a khayr. Perfection is a khayr. Money is a khayr. And, and so on, if it's, if it's uh, used in a proper way. طيب. Here we should ask, if there's a connection, as we said, between morality and love, we should ask what type of love is this that connects with morality? Because we said there's three types of love. Is it the divine love, is it the human love, or is it the, the love of desires? We believe that morality is based on divine love, of course. And you, you should know the answer. Imagine a chef sitting down and saying to you, morality is is based on the love of desires. There's no way. Right? So it has to be the, the, the divine love. But to explain it, we say an action that is based on the love of desires 
is done to fulfill my desires. An action that is performed based on the human love, it's done to fulfill my social needs. An action that is performed based on the divine love, it will be, if it's performed properly, it will be performed only for the sake of loving beauty and perfection and nothing else. You don't expect anything else from this love. From the love of desires, you expect something. From the love of the, the human love, you expect something. But when it comes to the love of the divine love, you pra if it's practiced in the proper way, you do it without expecting anything in return. You do it because you're attracted to the beauty and, you, and the perfection that you see in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, this doesn't mean that all religious people have reached this level. We are still far, far away from reaching this level. Until now, we still worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of fear. Out of fear. We do our actions not to, not to reach paradise. We say, Ya Allah, just keep us away from hellfire. We want to stay away from the punishment of Allah. Allah, we end in paradise, we don't end in paradise as long as we don't end in, in hellfire. Alhamdulillah, we're, 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 we're happy with that. So we still worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of fear. Only someone like Amir al Mu'min alayhi salam, or the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, or the heroes of Karbala, they can stand and say, Ya Allah, we love you because we found you worthy of being loved. We worship you because we found you worthy of being worthy of being worshipped. We don't worship you for the sake of the paradise, for the sake of the reward, or, or for the sake of staying away from your punishment. When you reach this level, and this is the important point, when you reach this level of understanding and practicing the divine love in a proper way, you can include the love of desires the love of humans, and every action you perform under this divine love. Where you connect every act you perform back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something that we spoke about before when we mentioned at tawheedul af'ali, unity in actions, where you connect every action back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you, when you deal with others or when you want to practice love on the level of a human love, you do it for the sake of Allah. When you want to practice your desires, you do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I've seen some people who make fun that some scholars, they say, even when you practice your desires, you have to remember Allah. They say, how is that possible? When you understand at tawheed al-af'ali, unity in action, and you understand that there's no will and, or power other than the will and power of Allah, then you will understand how to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every action that you perform. In every action that you perform. This is how you can include all the love and every action under this divine love and turn the actions to a moral act. You can turn every act you perform or every action you perform to a moral act through connecting it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which makes morality not limited to the definitions that we mentioned in philosophy. Any action, even moving your hand, if it's done in a proper way, it can be considered a moral act. Every moral, moral act, it consists of three elements. The objective act, what do you do, whatever you do. The subjective goal or intention, why do, we do, why do you do it? And the actual situation, where do you do it? Uh, with whom you do it, where do you do it, and, and so on, and the consequences of the action. If we choose a good act, any mubah, a good act, and have the intention of doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a proper way, this act will be considered as a moral act. And in fiqh, you read this. In fiqh, when they come to the mubahat, something that is mubah, they say if you have the correct intention of doing it for the sake of Allah, it becomes what? It becomes recommended, mustahab. If you want to drink water, in itself it's mubah. If you do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or before you do it, you remember Sayyid al-Shuhada, Abi Abdullah Hussain alayhi salam. It becomes recommended. The same thing with any action that you want to perform. If you do it in a proper way, if you 
connect it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through at-tawheed al-af'ali, then you can turn it to a moral act. Love is the seed of morality, and morality is the love of beauty and perfection. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمِ الْأَخْلَاقِ I was sent to perfect moral character. Perfecting moral character is done through awakening the love that we have inside of us. This is how moral character is perfected. And this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was sent to do. To awaken this love inside of our heart and make us reflect on perfecting our morals through seeking the signs of beauty. Now to the third point. Why do we love the heroes of Karbala? Inshallah, we'll try to finish, finish in less than 10 minutes. So it's been 30 minutes so far, so inshallah, up to 40 minutes would, would be good. The Hajj is in a hurry. Just like, yes, alhamdulillah, in 10 minutes. Why do we love the heroes of Karbala? When we meet with the blessed anniversary of the birth of the heroes of Karbala, especially their master, Sayyid al-Shuhada, Abi Abdullah al-Hussein alayhi salam, we find that their love occupies our hearts and minds. And it's a true love. Yani we can fake anything we want. We can act pious. We can hide all our sins. Right? But we can stand here and say, inshallah, all of us, we can stand and say that we truly love the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. This is something, maybe the only truth that we have, that we love them, alayhum salam If we go back to the hadith that we started with, أحب الله من أحب حسين May Allah love the one who loves Hussein. We ask, why do we love Imam Hussein alayhi salam? And what type of love is this? Allah, I've been taking you right and left, right and left with love and morality to get to here. Why do we love Imam Hussein alayhi salam? And what type of love is this? Are you still with me or are you lost? It's all good so far? Inshallah. Now, some people, they... What, would you give me an answer? Can you give me an answer? Why do you love Imam Hussein? So I can drink my tea before I continue. Any answer? Okay. I finished from my tea. I answered. Some people they love Imam al Hussein because he is the grandson of the Prophet. This is the only reason why. It's similar to, for example, if you know someone very well and they pass away. If you see their children or your grandchildren, you will love them because they remember you or they remind you of this friend that you had. This love can be, we can refer to it as a simple love. You express your feelings through a simple way. Okay. Some people love Imam Hussain for the sacrifices he did. If it was not for the movement of Imam Hussain we would have nothing today. And this is the truth. Everything we have is from this revolution. As Imam Khomeini says, كل ما لدينا من عشرة. Everything that we have is from Ashura. Now, this can be included under the third type of love, love of desires. Hey, I have a desire to succeed in my movement. I have a desire to achieve power. And I find that the way to achieve this is through following the teachings of Imam Hussain. So I connect to him. I love him for what he did to me. I love him for, for the good that he did for the humanity. And maybe this is how most of us, or the reason why most of us love Imam Hussain Because we can connect to him through the sacrifices that he did. But we can look at this, uh, this love, or we can classify it as the love of the tradies. The love of the tradies. It's like you have a business. Because he gave you something good, you connect to him. Because he achieved something good for humanity, you connect to him. Of course, there's nothing wrong in that. There's nothing wrong to love Imam Hussain just because he is the grandson of the Prophet. There's nothing wrong to love Imam Hussain because of the, uh, the, the movement that he did and the sacrifices that he uh, achieved. But when it comes to love, as we mentioned, there's different types and there's different levels. Different levels. 
Third group of people, they love Imam al Hussein alayhi salam because they see him as a manifestation and the sign for the beauty and perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not because he is the grandson of the Prophet. Not because of the sacrifices that he did only. No. They love Imam al Hussein because they see him as someone who represents Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is mentioned even in, in Karbala. They mentioned when Imam Zainul Abidin salam looked at the, the body of his father, Salawatullah alayhi, Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, she asked him, What's wrong with you, Ya Zainul Abidin? He said to her, Hada jasadu waliyillah. He said, This is the, the body of the friend of Allah. He didn't say, This is the body of my father only. Because he understood the status of his father, Sayyidu Shuhada alayhi salam. He connected with him, Imam Zainal Abidin connected to Imam al Hussein, not because he is only his father. He connected to him because he saw the signs of perfection and beauty in his personality. And the same thing with the pious believers. They connect to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam because of that. The divine essence of existence, as that al was uh, or appeared in the attributes. Or the names. They appeared in the attributes or the names. Ar Rahman, Allah, Ar Rahim. These are the names and the attributes. Ad Dhat al Muqaddasa appeared in them. And the names were reflected in the purified lights of the Ahlul Bayt. And in the light, of course, of their master Rasulullah. Because morality is the love of beauty and perfection, and the divine love is part of our nature, we find ourselves attracted and in love with the purified Imams السلام, Why? Because they are the complete sign for the perfection and beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why we connect to them. And when it comes to our fourth Imam, Imam Ali ibn Hussein alayhi salam, we find the treasure of moral values that he produced through his supplications and through his teachings. If anyone wants to learn how to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all what they need to do is to read the supplications of Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam. If you want to learn how to deal with yourself, how to deal with Allah on a spiritual level, how to deal with the community on a, on a social level, all what you need is to refer back to Risalat al Hukuk of Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam. Um, Seeing that we are in, in Sha'ban, Imam Zainal Abidin he used to recite, uh, always he used to recite Al Munajatu Sha'baniya, which was, which was narrated from Imam Ali. Alayhi salam. He used to recite this Munajat and he used to repeat this part more than once. This part it says in Al Munajat, it says, speaking to Allah, وَإِنْ أَدْخَلْتَنِ النَّارِ أَعْلَمْتُ أَهْلَهَا أَنِّي أُحِبُّكَ Which means, and if you enter me to hell fire, I will inform its people that I love you. This is the meaning of divine love. Imam Zainal Abin alayhi salam, he wants to say, or Imam Ali, or the Imams in general, they want to say that, Ya Allah, we love you because you are worthy of being loved. Not to receive anything. And even if you decide through your power, through your will, through your justice, through your knowledge to put us in hellfire, we would not reject we would go around, even if we are getting burnt, telling people of hellfire that we love you. This is the pure love. This is the true love of Allah. Because they don't wait for anything in return. They don't wait for anything in return. As for the third pious servant of Allah, Mawlana Abu Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam, words don't do him justice. He struggled himself and melted in the love of Sayyidul Shuhada alayhi salam. His love was not only because Imam al Hussein was his brother. How many brothers killed each other throughout history? The sons of Adam alayhi salam killed each other. The brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam tried to kill him. And so on. So on. many brothers they tried or killed each other. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam, he loved Imam al Hussein because he comprehended his status. 
he, he understood that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is the sign of the perfection and beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in return, when Abu al Fadl al Abbas alayhi salam loved Imam al Hussein, Allah loved him back. Because the Prophet, as he says, what does he say? Ahabba Allahu 